John Ball, thank you so much for having me down to Wilmington, North Carolina to visit GE. I've been dying to get down here for how long has it been that we've known each other now? Well, I think it's been maybe a year, year and a half. But, yeah. Uh, no, yeah, I've been excited ever since I heard about the projects that you're working on. So it's a real honor to be here. Um, you're the executive vice president of new plant projects here. But before we get into your current role, I would love to just start with your story and how you got into the sector. Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, you know, my background um, educationally was chemistry. And I really never anticipated um, getting into the nucle nuclear space. Uh, but uh, I got a PhD in chemistry from Penn State University. And when I left, or when I was graduating, I had a couple opportunities. I could go work R&D for international paper, or I had an opportunity to go out to the Hanford site, working for mm -hmm. Westinghouse Hanford, uh, really focused on some new technologies, trying to characterize the high-level tank waste that was out there. High-level tank waste. Tell, tell me about that. What are the different, what are the different levels of waste that might be at Hanford? And Hanford, just for those who don't know, this is uh, where they used to make nuclear weapons material. <clears throat> That's right. It's where they, it's where they used to make uh, weapons-grade plutonium. And so they had a number number of reactors. They had a Purex facility to separate out uranium and plutonium. And in the process of doing that, they generated um, somewhere on the order of like 50 million gallons of high-level waste. Ooh. And so basically, it was tanks full of fission products. And um, it was actually, it was the work that I did there where just my fascination for fission um, and nuclear really um, came to life. Because you know, here I'm a chemist, I'm analyzing these, these the tank waste and um, using different methods. And essentially what you could do with, with these different techniques could overlay the results and come out with a perfect fission product yield curve. So it was essentially, you know, the chart of the nucleides, basically the entire periodic table was uh, present, um, much of which was highly radioactive and yeah, so uh, in, what, those, in those tanks. What are the challenges with containing material in a tank when it's radioactive? Is it the, is it the radioactivity that might degrade the wall of the tank? Is it the toxicity of this mishmash of different elements? What's actually acting on the tank itself? Yeah, I think, well, I think that um, it's a corrosive environment and so, and it's radioactive. And so the fact that it's been, these, these wastes have been underground for so many years there's concerns that the tanks are beginning to degrade and, and really what they're trying to avoid is um, for the uh, radioactivity to get into, you know, into, out into the groundwater, into the environment. So this work was really focused on characterizing that waste so that ultimately it could be vitrified for long-term storage. And what does vitrified mean? Basically turning it into glass, glass logs. Now, um, one of the unique challenges of radioactive waste is that its chemistry is actually changing over time as the fission products decay, right? That, that is true. So, how, yeah, how do you map out that change over time and how do you figure out what's actually inside of it? I mean, do you have to take samples or what do you do? Yeah, well, that, well that's, exactly, that's exactly what we were doing is, um, you know, taking both liquid samples as well as sludge samples because in these tanks, you had um, components that were soluble um, and in the aqueous form, and then you had some that precipitated out. And as you said, you know, just because the fact that they're decaying, they are changing over time. And so we'd use um, both, you know, radiological methods, but we used a lot of mass spectrometry mm. um, to determine exactly what, uh, what isotopes were present at a given time. And were you living out at Hanford at the time? I was. I was living in the Tri Cities, actually. Uh, so Pasco, one of the three, one of the three Tri Cities. This is Eastern Washington. Eastern right? Washington, That's which right. is kind of like a desert. Even though we think of like Washington and Seattle as a this lush green place, that's a desert. It's an absolute desert. Three hundred days of sunshine. It's actually a, it's a wonderful place uh, to live. Uh, beautiful place. And then, so where did you transition to from there? Yeah. So I. Um, came from, so I spent about five years out at the Hanford site, and um, I had a, a recruiter actually contacted me about an opportunity, 
at, uh, with a nuclear company in Wilmington, North Carolina. And I knew right off the bat it was GE. Yeah. Uh, my father actually had worked for GE for 20 plus years. And so I had, it was in my DNA, it not went, for the nuclear segment, but he worked. Um, what did he do? He was, um, so he had kind of an interesting background. Um, he started in what's called a manufacturing management program. Mm. So he did a number of rotations. I was born in Schenectady. Um, and so he worked on, you know, um, steam turbine uh, manufacturing. He was part of the generator um, line as well. Okay, so power has been in your blood. Power is in my blood. But then he went and the most of his career was, um, GE was very big into selling um, time timeshare on mainframe computers. And in that business, and so he kind of worked his way through through that business. Um, and but ultimately it was sold. There was a, a time when if you weren't number one or number two in your industry space, this was part of the Jack Welch era. Um, so his business was ultimately was divested. Um, now I remember you were uh, you were when during your education you were pretty early on in some of the artificial intelligence stuff too, weren't you? Yeah. So I think so. I got that. I got that from my dad. That's what I was wondering. So, if you, yeah, yeah. So so. Growing up, we always had computers in our house, most of which were the you know the old terminals where you plug in the phone. Um, so you know I I played around with kind of programming and Fortran and stuff at a young age. We always had the very first uh, you know the first Mac that came out, um, and so I got involved in um, doing computational chemistry in graduate school. And so you know this was it was taking kind of the, the, the physical, the, the, the structure of, a, of an organic compound, um, you know, basically the, the types of atoms, their geometries, and then trying, taking that and trying to predict chemical properties. So your dad really did have a pretty big influence on kind of types of things that you wanted to learn about and where you ended up going and then coming to end up and work for GE. Yeah, absolutely. That's pretty amazing. Um, so when you first started at GE, what was the first role that you had? So I started back in our fuel manufacturing operation, and uh, I was the the laboratory manager. So we've got a a quality testing lab to ensure the the, the quality of uh, both the um, the fuel, the uranium, as well as the components. Yeah, I just got so, a tour uh, tour this morning yeah. of, the, of the fuel site there. Awesome. So you probably walked by my first office. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I spent um, so after that role, I became the quality leader for our fuels business. And then I led our manufacturing um, operation as well. So first seven years here was in fuels. Yeah. And then I switched over and uh, um, was in our services business for about seven years as well. Um, before we go into services, fuels, did you see things change much during that time, during the seven years? Or is the idea just keep, per- keep the same thing, but just keep perfecting it and keep perfecting the process? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, we were, there were, um, certainly there were new fuel um, introductions um, that were taking place, you know, so as we went from, um, at the time, a GE14 to a GNF2 fuel. So what does that mean? What are these? Well, so th- so th- this is, th- these are all um, 10 by 10 um, boiling water reactor fuel, mm-hmm. but just going into a new fuel design. So as I worked part of the fuels business, um, whether I was in manufacturing or quality, it was part of some of those activities. And then clearly, just always, you know, a strive for how we run the operation in a in a safer uh, manner, but also you know driving productivity. So those were always big focus areas of mine. And when it comes to driving productivity, what comes in? Is there like a new robotic? tube handler that might come in and help you make things go faster? What, what are some of the tools that you might use to make a fuel assembly line work better? So, um, you know, certainly you can use um, automation. Um, what I would say my experience has been around uh, the principles of lean manufacturing and the Toyota production system. Mm. You know, it's amazing how, how much um, waste you can identify in those processes. Mm and just make jobs better, just make them easier for the operator. So they've got, they've got what they need um, when they need it, right, you know, right where they need it yep. um, all the time. And so um, 
that's been a you know a big focus um, of mine and and our companies, really to drive drive productivity. And then once you perfect that, um, so I think I think one of the mistakes often in manufacturing is you jump to automation, mm. when really it can be very simple in terms of just making the workspace as efficient as possible for the operator. Okay, that's some good wisdom there because I bet a lot of people who are coming into you know. You, you know, whether it be their own new designs or whatever they might be working on, they, that might be the first thing that they think is robotics. You know, we're in the modern century. Let's just jump to having robots do it. I mean, even Elon Musk, that wasn't, didn't he say one of the big mistakes that I made was I tried to make robots build the whole car before we were ready to do that? No, I wasn't, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, I think he said something like that. Um, but yeah, that comes from manufacturing experience. So, okay, so services. So what kind of services does, does GE offer? Yeah, so um, really, you know, for the um, for the for the breadth of of the plant, so um, engineering services. Um, so we do we uh, have done a lot of upgrades, especially um, you know something called extended power upgrade, mm. where you we can analyze the plant, and you know there's a lot of margin that's already built into the design basis of a nuclear plant, and so. Uh, we actually created an, a licensing topical report, an LTR process that just maps out how you would implement an extended power up rate. Mm. Just about every BWR, there's a couple that haven't in the U.S., have taken advantage of that because you can get up to 20% additional power essentially with the same reactor. You've got to change out, you've got to upgrade the steam path and some balance of plant items. What about the turbine? Can the, whatever turbine was installed, because I imagine that's a huge cost item. Yeah. Whatever turbine was installed before, can that handle just pumping more steam through it? No, so typically you would have to upgrade the, the, the steam path. You have to o- open it up. You may have to um, resize or upgrade the generator as well. So those are some of the high cost items yeah. associated with an uprate, but compared to building a new plant, <laughs> yeah, you th- think about getting like for a, for a gigawatt size plant, get additional 200 megawatts. Amazing. At, and is that uh, typically what the uprate might be going from a gigawatt? 20%. To, yeah. Yeah, 20%. So you get, yeah. Yeah, a you do that hundred. across five of them, it's like you built a new plant. We actually, yeah, so I did a calculation. We've, we've actually implemented the equivalent of three new units <laughs> through extended power uprates. <laughs> that's awesome. Yep. So that's, so, um, so EPUs and, and these upgrades is a big piece of what our services team does. Um, I had the opportunity to lead that business for a while, but then um, probably the, the real traditional aspect of services is outage management, mm. field services, where we, you know, every 12 to 24 months, depending on the fuel cycle, reactor shuts down, we come in, we, we take apart the reactor, we help move fuel, we do inspections. If there's an issue, we address that issue either through analysis or perhaps a modification. What kind of issues might cro- crop up during these outage inspections? Uh, you know, they might find uh, you know they might find a crack, mm. as an example. And what do you um, do? Like, what's the remedy for a crack? So the remedy it really depends on what part of the reactor it's found in, but the remedy would be either a, a repair or through some analysis, um, you could justify continued operation mm. for a for a certain period of time, and so. You know, our engineering team is highly experienced at doing uh, both of those. And when some they do cases, a repair, are yeah. they like sending a guy with some scuba gear and a, and a welding oh. torch underwater? And is that what's happening there? So we do a lot of work underwater. Um, awesome. Obviously, for for Alara purposes, um, if Alara, we get, spell out what that means. Um, as low as reasonably achievable, and so time, distance, and shielding. Um, and, and this is so uh, wanna, this is with respect to radiation. Exposure. With respect to radiation, right? And so, um, wherever possible, we like to use you know automated tools. Um, we've got you know submarine type tools that can go swim at you know depths of 50, 60 feet in the water. And if we can use those to help with repairs, we'll do that. There are some cases where we do send divers that do underwater welding um, to perform certain modifications and repairs. Yeah, that's a, that's a hell of a introduction. <laughs> what, do, what do you do for work? Oh, I'm a nuclear underwater welder, that's right. scuba diver. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I meant to ask one more thing before we leave the power upright. Has a 
a unit ever been upgraded twice the same unit? Have it ever like added 20% and then another 20%? It's, a, it's actually a great question. So um, we have, there's three different types of upgrades. So we have, the first one is a, what's called a measurement uncertainty recapture. So it's basically, it's taking the uncertainty in the flow meter measurement and you can gain an additional one and a half percent of output. Those are very easy to do. Um, an another one is you go up to 5% of original licensed thermal power. That's called a stretch uprate. We had a number of, of customers had opted for that as the first step. And then the ultimate step is um, extended power uprate 20%. So we have had some that have done the, the, the measurement uncertainty recapture or MUR first, then maybe go on to a stretch and then EPU. We're now seeing customers that have done the EPU at 120%. The only thing else that they, they can add on to that would be the MUR, so the additional 1.5%. Mm. So once you've done that, you can't do two 20% uprates, and, and but the max would be the 121.5. And basically. what's the limiting factor there? Is it you just can't physically fit any more fuel in the reactor? Or what's, other than regulations, let's say, uh, what would be the physical limitation on operating an existing infrastructure? Yeah, we've done, um, so every reactor is a little bit different, but we've done, we do these, um, and they're very plant specific. You do, we do a pinch point analysis to determine what is the limiting factor by plant. Mm. And so it does, it does vary. But in what we've licensed with the NRC right now, so we have a licensed approach, this LTR I mentioned. Mm. And so we've only gone to the, you know, up to the 120%. So right now, um, that, is, that is a limitation. So I see, so you uh, brought a plan of action to the NRC and said, can you approve this? And then if we get this uh, pre-approval of this plan, we can then implement it in other facilities um, with just a, a less rigorous, I guess, inspection on their part or? Yeah, so we, the way the process works, so we, yeah, we have a generic LTR that applies, that applies to any plant that we would go evaluate. We then take that and it's really, it's a, it's a roadmap. It's, you, you've got to go do analysis A, B, and C. Um, we then take the actual, the, the specific plant and we do plant specific analyses per this roadmap or this menu of items that we have to go analyze. And we get a plant specific safety analysis. And then they submit, um, they being the, the plant the utility then submits that as a license amendment mm. to get approval to operate um, at higher powers, but they are referencing this pre-approved roadmap to, Got it. to do so. Got it. Yeah, I was just thinking if it worked once and there's no real physical limitation, but maybe just another kind of redesign effort, perhaps build another three reactors through more operating. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think at, I think at some point there you probably are going to have some yeah, limitations some sort of physical on limitations. Yeah. Um, okay, so then does that bring you to what you do today? You, were, you went through fuel, then services, then? Went through fuel, services. I, I ran our um, manufacturing supply chain operation for the, for the nuclear business. And then it was from there I stepped into new plants. So tell, tell me, what, what are new plants? What does that role mean? Yeah, so it's, it's evolved since I've taken the job. So I've, you know, I've been doing this, um, I'm coming up on four years in November. And when I first um, took the role, we were working on ESBWR. And the Economically the Simplified right, Boiling, boiling water, water Reactor. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, it had been certified by the NRC back in 2014. We had two customers, um, Dominion and DTE, that had um, licenses. Dominion is a U.S. utility? U.S. utility and based out of Richmond. DTE is Detroit um, Edison, got it. So up in Michigan, um, and they both had licenses to construct and operate um, ESBWR. Wow, what happened so, then? So I was, so we were actually working on the the, the North Anna Three um, project for Dominion, and you know we were going through some of the detailed design work, and you know they got to a point, and it really was the market where just with the continued low gas prices, 
um, just couldn't justify the the investment of a large light water reactor. Yeah. So we really um, so the project was suspended, um, and it really was at that point that you know I took a step back and recognize that we had to start thinking about this market completely different. Mm. That the, the, you know, the market, there, there may be some, some special case, cases or niche markets for these large light water reactors. Because mm. the SPWR, how much, what was the power? It was 1,500 megawatts. Electric? Yes. Whoa. Yeah. It's a, it's a yeah, beast. It's a beast, yep. And so bigger than our advanced boiling water reactor that's <laughs> operating, that's about 13, 1350. Yeah, I mean, that would put it on par with the largest reactors in the world at 1500 megawatts. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So, so so here you are, you're, you're looking at the economic situation and you're making strategic decisions now to just kind of recalibrate how the company thinks about the products that they want to put on the market. That's right. That's right. So, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. We uh, went back and we were looking at kind of historically our company and we've been in this, in the nuclear industry, we're really, you know, pioneers in the commercial nuclear space. And we actually got involved in the early days of fission. And back in the late 40s, for about 20 years, we had tremendous amount of design work on micro reactors and SMRs. Mm. And uh, it's what's, funny because those seem like a new new terms now. That it feels like these right. terms were invented in the last five, ten years. Right. But that's not true. There was tremendous focus <laughs> back in the early days. But what we but what we as an industry did is we really focus on these economies of scale of these large reactors. Well, we've come full circle. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, the, the kind of the learnings coming out of the North Anna 3 suspension, and really just looking at, you look at gas prices being at the historic lows. We had, you know, there's projects around the world, these large projects that over budget, over schedule. We knew we had to do things different. Yeah. And so that's where we, we really changed our focus back to SMRs okay, so, and, and advanced reactors. Okay, so you, you're looking at the situation, you're saying instead of going economies of scale large in terms of the physical size of and scale of a reactor and being able to get better economics on a price of electricity basis, because the market couldn't afford such large capital installations all in, in one time in one place, now you're thinking, Boy, you know, there's another type of economies of scale, and that's making many of something, uh, and that's what building uh, smaller plants using standard supply chains for parts. That's what. That's how you can achieve uh, better cost effectiveness, and that's what the concept behind SMR really is, right? Yeah. That, no. That's that. That's absolutely right. Uh, and <clears throat> so, so tell me. Okay. So you guys decide we're gonna we're gonna start building smaller. What does that look like? Do you you put together like a skunk works team or what happens? Yeah, so um, it's exactly what we did. So so we, we gathered a, a very small team, um, five or six experts. Yeah. And we've got a um, ideation lab here on site mm. and uh, we blocked it out for two months. <laughs> and we, we co-located this team and we, and we, we said, go, we, go figure this out. All right, how'd you pick your Come five back, or six people? Um, it's just best and brightest, right? <laughs> so you and know, you, we and just, you knew, and we you just, knew all these just, people from from having worked here for, for a while, yeah. or did you did you call around to different department heads and you said, you know, it's, send me an expert on this, send me an expert on that? How did you kind of knew who these people were and just in collaborating with some other managers too? And, and had these and people how, also expressed interest in? Doing something new and doing something different, or is it pulling teeth a little bit to get them on a different project? No. So, so when, so when, when so when I approached them, um, people knew yeah. that that we had to think about things differently, right? Yeah. So they were passionate about coming up with a new idea. Yeah. So I think they were they were all in. So it, what's interesting is we actually started thinking about this using Prism, mm. which is our sodium fast reactor. PRISM stands for uh, Power Reactive Innovative Small Module. Which has been around since the 80s. Been around since the 80s. Um, We believe there's a bright future for fast reactors. If you think about a world where, you know, you can use use fuel as an asset instead of a waste form or uh, consume plutonium. So, um, and just based on its inherent safety and simplicity, we thought, okay, well, Maybe this is the way to really drive costs down. Mm. And so 
the, the team went off and they started talking to a bunch of customers and uh, both here in the US and abroad. And what they heard, a couple key messages. They said, number one, if, if, if we're gonna consider building new nuclear going forward, you've gotta figure out how to compete with combined cycle gas, mm. head to head. Yep. So, you know, we often, we're all for, you know, any incentives, whether it's, you know, carbon legislation, anything that will, would benefit nuclear. But what we recognize is there's no, we can't control those things. The only thing we can control is how we innovate around safety, around cost. And cost is was key here. Yeah. So they said, got to be competitive with, with gas. And then number two, we really aren't interested in investing more than a billion dollars in a new plant. In other words, we don't want to bet the company on a, on a new unit. And when you say invest a billion dollars, do you mean a billion dollars in licensing fees, a billion dollars in all-in costs, a billion dollars in the construction of the first plant? What's the billion dollars? Billion dollars all-in to construct a plant. Okay, got it. Yep. So, so we, you know, we took a step back and we, and we thought with those inputs, wow, that is a significant challenge. Yeah. Um, so the team kept, kept working and they were thinking around PRISM and I'll never forget. I'll never forget the day, because they actually pivoted, and they recognized that hey, if we take ESBWR, so it's proven technology, it's proven supply chain, um, and if we can figure out how to how to simplify this to eliminate a loss of coolant accident, mm. it basically can eliminate um, many uh, of the systems and structure associated with that plant. Dramat, I mean, dramatic simplification. So they started thinking about this and they, they actually started working on it on the weekends and evenings on their own time as well. They were really passionate about this, but I'll never forget a couple of the innovators came into my office on a Friday afternoon and started walking me through this. Yeah. And I was, I was blown away. Um, I mean, incredibly inspired by kind of what they had, what they had come up with. And so I knew we were on to something that could be a game changer for this industry. And so, you know, from that point, you know, we obviously we we um, issued um, patent disclosures, try to protect, obviously protect the idea, and then really go went out and try to find partners and investors um, to help you know collaborate with us. Did you uh, get them their own office space so they weren't bucking up the ideation lab for the rest of the? Yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah, so they moved uh, moved back to their normal locations, and actually, we did put them um, in in a location so they were close to each other, so they could continue to work on the idea together. Awesome. Okay, so now let's talk about customers. So you've got the basic concept down. You've got so you want to make essentially a small ESBWR. That's what you guys. That's right. High level. That's what you guys that's right. uh, put together. And you're running some basic numbers, you're saying, "Man, I really think that we can make this you know, cheap too." Um, so. How do you take the next steps to making a commercial reality? You got to find a customer, right? Where, where does that come in? Right. So, um, so I, it starts with you know our first investor, which is which was Dominion. So you know they're investing in the technology, um, and then we're also from a from a development standpoint collaborating with uh, Bechtel on the EPC side, Exelon from an operation standpoint. Because one of the keys to this design is really designing it for a significant reduction in, in staffing, mm. and then MIT is another is another partner. Um, but then it's just a matter of you know we've been obviously you know traveling around the world. There's a lot of markets where you know there's going to be a need for SMRs. Canada is a great example. We just entered into the vendor design review process in Canada. Mm. There's now eleven. Um, 11 technologies. We were the 11th to, to, to enter into that process. So we think SMRs in Canada, there's a bright future there. Um, I think in the US eventually as well. I think once we solve the cost equation mm. um, and we can be competitive with gas generation and we have line of sight to do that, there's been some studies. EPRI's put out a, a study that shows that you could make a significant dent um, from a generation source perspective, um, with nuclear, but you've got to be at the right, you've got to be at the right price point. So let's and it's, let's talk about that. So there's a couple different price points. There's the price point for the the total build cost, 
and that determines you know what kind of markets you can enter uh, you know and how well capitalized your customer has to be there's the price point for the electricity and that's what it's going to be competing with mm -hmm. uh, with natural gas if it's in a, it's in a market mm -hmm. where there's doing head-on competition um, and these two things are probably affected by the final size of your unit, whatever you end up on. So how did you think about that? As you decided you were going to make it small, uh, a small modular reactor, small reactor, uh, did you weigh economics in with pinpointing what that final power output would be? Yeah, so... Um yeah, so I, I, think it's a, I think it's a great question. So, this, so we took a design for cost um, approach. And... And one of the things we looked at, and a you know big cost of a of a of a nuclear plant is the turbine island, mm. um, and the and the balance of plant. And so you know being part of GE, we went you know to our um, our our steam power systems um, company yeah. or division, and what we really asked for were some off the shelf um, solutions. Awesome. And. And what they came back with, the, the, the recommendation was this 300 megawatts was just an, an ideal size, something we've deployed, you know, thousands of times, or, you know, around the world. And so, can you use an off-the-shelf 300 megawatt steam turbine that might be being built for all sorts of other steam applications? Can you just connect it to a boiling water reactor where you've got the, the, the primary coolant uh, running directly through the turbine, can you still use an off-the-shelf one, or some modifications need to be made? Um, yeah, for the most part, it's it's off-the-shelf. I mean, there there may be some some you know minor tweaks, but when you think about like these large light water reactors that um, you know these large steam turbines, you don't build a lot of them. Yeah, and a lot of them um, can also be highly customized as well. Mm. And so you avoid, I mean, that's a significant investment that can, that can be avoided. Awesome. So, so that was a key decision in terms of hitting kind of our cost targets, but also what's the right power level. The, the other thing we thought about was, you know, there, there's going to be a lot of coal retirements, mm. um, we believe, you know, over the next several decades. Definitely. Whether U.S., Canada, or elsewhere around the world. And 300 megawatts seem like a pretty good size for um, for those replacements. You've got some larger coal plants where maybe you could put in two of these units to replace that coal. You've got some smaller ones where it's a it's a good fit. And then and then just the grid size. So if you're if you're going to go to countries that don't have a well developed infrastructure, um, you know Africa is a great example. They're never going to be able to take well. I, Never is too strong, but it's going to be a long time before they can take gigawatt size um, technology. Whereas these the smaller units will fit in those um, more, you know, underdeveloped uh, regions of the world. So, um, I mean, it's a big world out there, and there's a lot of different market uh, considerations. How do you narrow down? I mean, it, there's going to be different things you have to do. Maybe even from a technical perspective, but certainly from a sales perspective, to replace a coal plant in the U.S. than to go to Lagos, Nigeria, mm -hmm. and you know build something there. How do you even narrow down those two options? Where, what, what's the what's the strategy? <laughs> <laughs> well, you have you certainly you get you have a lot of discussions, yeah. obviously, right? And and everyone has you've got limited resources and time. And so you focus where there's the greatest, um, the greatest promise. And so you know I think there's just a lot of inputs, obviously, that we weigh from each of these regions, each of these customers, figure out who's closest, who has a a nuclear regime in place or is close to it. Um, are we able to export? Right? Do do we depend on um, approvals from the from the U.S. government? Do we have a one two three agreement in place? So these are all things that are important in terms of focusing both near term versus thinking longer term about a particular region. And I'm not sure we've mentioned it yet. This is this is called the X300, right? This That's is right. The, this is the reactor we're talking about here. That's right. Um, is there? Uh, can you borrow some of the work that you did to license the ESBWR to submit to the NRC to shorten the total licensing? cost process period 
um, when it comes to the X300. Yeah. Yeah, so so by the way, so the so the name BWR X300, boiling water reactor. X stands for 10th generation. Oh cool. Boiling water reactor 300 is the output. I thought it was just like X-Men. I thought it was just Well, cool. and plus it's kind of a cool yeah. name. <laughs> <laughs> um, based on ESBWR design and which was licensed. And so yes, there's there is a significant amount that we can pull directly or scale from the ESBWR um, certified design. Um, you know, we spent hundreds of millions of dollars on certifying ESBWR. Um, DOE helped us. So there, there is a significant investment both from GE, from the Department of Energy on ESBWR and actually indirectly now on BWR X300 that, because mm. we can take that investment and all that know-how and leverage it for X300. So yes, we think that the time to license is gonna be much shorter um, as a result of that. We, what we plan in the US is not doing a part 52 approach. Mm. We plan on part 50. Can you explain the difference between the two? So in a part 52, you would have, you basically, you certify your design first and then um, a utility would get a license to construct and operate that plant. In a Part 50 approach, every operating U.S. reactor went through that licensing approach where you are able to um, begin construction much earlier. Mm. You've got more flexibility mm. in how you construct. You can make changes in the final design, and then that's ultimately what, what is certified for for operations isn't there a risk though i mean wasn't one of the reasons that they switched that they allowed for the part 52 was to give some certainty to the developer that that they would be able to get the thing actually running um prior to investing all of the money to actually building it is there a risk that you could build it and then the nrc just never sign off on it so um, I would say there's always there's always that risk, right? You you can't you can't predict everything. So I think you're absolutely right that the new approach, the Part 52 approach, does protect um, the utility so that you've got a certified design before it's constructed. Um, so you know clearly you know that's an advantage, and there, there's you know pluses and minuses going both ways. Um, on the flip side, you think about the Part 52 approach, it puts a tremendous amount of risk and pressure on the OEM, mm. like ourselves, like a Westinghouse or anyone else, new scale designing reactors, because the amount of capital required to design and license, and then if you don't ultimately build that reactor, mm. then you know, you'll never be able to recover that, that investment. Got it. So, you know, we experienced that, quite frankly, with ESBWR. Mm. Uh, you know, we, um, it's, a f it's a phenomenal reactor, but just based, based on the economics with large light water reactors, there's not a market for it today. Now, someday, could there be? Sure. Um, so w we want to use a different approach um, versus using part 52. Smaller, so I, so more I, flexible. I'm getting the themes here. So, yeah. so, I, so I think there's a, I think there's a, there's a balance, um, and I think you know time to market for utility. I think the the time to to construct and start generating power and revenue for utility is much can be much shorter in a Part 50 approach. So that could be beneficial to them from that perspective as well. Would you, um, if you were to build it abroad? you would just license it through whatever host country's regulator it would be. Um, what are some of the countries that stand out to you right now as potentially good markets for this type of technology? Well, I mentioned, I mentioned Canada. It's no surprise, right? There's a lot of interest in, in SMRs in Canada. You know, I think that you know, the UK, I think, eventually is going to be They've expressed a lot of interest mm. in SMR technology. Have, yeah. um, 
I think, you know, there's regions of Africa, the Middle East, Southeast Asia. I mean, pick, you pretty much pick just about every region. I think there's there's promise. Okay, some, so, how, so some, how do we narrow some in? Sooner, some sooner than others. It's probably then a function of, um, the country has to be a certain level of developed because you still got to still got to like build the thing and it's a complicated thing. So you want them to be able to su- have the infrastructure to support a, a, a sophisticated construction project. So that's probably mm-hmm. one criteria. Um, what about in terms of capital? They've got to they have to pay for it first, or is there like a, 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 a the ability to make it a turnkey product where um, there's some sort of financing structure that you guys are able to apply to cover the costs and then sell it to them after it's done. Is that? Well, that, and then, and then you, of course, you've got XM, XM financing for, that's the export import bank. Yep. So I think, you know, that's a, that's a mechanism that, um, should be used. Um, you know, and, and I think the, you know, the other reason, again, why we focused on a billion dollars or less is it's a lot easier. That's a, that's a much more, uh, you know, financeable um, project versus, you know, multi-billion dollars. Yeah. And then the other thing um, in terms of market selection, you probably want to find somewhere where the cost of energy right now is pretty high. And there's all sorts, I mean, like, so, you know, we're overflowing in gas in parts of the U.S. here, but there are other places where you don't have to compete head on with gas just because they don't have the infrastructure. That's right. To receive or distribute gas. That's right. Um, so those are probably pretty attractive markets as well. That's right. Yep. There, there, there are some of those. You can tell that, I'm fishing. That, I'm trying to get you yeah, to get me some yeah, locations and, here. <laughs> so Is it working? I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave it at the, re- <laughs> I, I mentioned some regions, but yeah, there's some, there's some very interesting, um, you know, specific countries that would meet, that would meet that profile. And uh, yeah, cause, cause yeah, the, the U S and Canada, I think are unique in that they've got these really low gas prices, but that's not the dynamic in, in every corner of the world. Yeah. And then also in your portfolio, you mentioned it before, but the PRISM reactor, it also has, um, it's getting some legs under it right now. It's been around forever, but mm-hmm. um, am I allowed to say this? That, uh, with the, v, the vertical? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Sure. sure. Well, why don't you tell us the, the whole story about uh, yeah, the, where the, PRISM's going? From. Yeah. VTR, so VTR is the versatile test reactor. Yeah. So last year, um, the Nuclear Energy Innovation and Capabilities Act, I think that's NECA? was signed into law that calls for a VTR by the end of 2025. Um, and so we entered a, a competitive uh, bid process um, about a year ago. And because we've been working on PRISM for really since the early 80s, um, you know, we've continued to advance the design. And so uh, we were selected. Uh, the, the, the US government, DOE, has invested in PRISM in the past. So it's a great way to leverage their prior investment um, and then use it for the VTR. Now, VTR is, it's not gonna be a power producing reactor. Mm. So this is a, a test reactor that provides fast neutrons. And the reason we need fast neutrons is if you think, if you think about, or if you believe that advanced reactor technology and specifically fast reactors are gonna play an important role in the future, then we have to have a mechanism to test um, the the materials, the components, the fuels that will go into other fast reactors. So you really, you can't have one without the other. You've got to have both. It's like a reactor that serves as a prototype lab for other reactors. That's that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, we're looking at two fairly exciting projects that are most definitely going to be foundational to the start of transforming this industry moving forward. I mean, we're in this position where we've got to start delivering cheaper nuclear products. You know, regardless of why it hasn't happened before, the world depends on us now. It depends on us bringing inexpensive nuclear to the market. And the work that you're doing is critical towards making that a reality. It's what, uh, gets me excited, gets me up every morning, and that's what I'm passionate about. So, so tell me, in your own words, I mean, what, does, what does the future of nuclear look like? So, so I, I am a strong believer that uh, we are gonna see this shift to SMRs 
and advanced reactors, as well as the, these micro reactors. So, you know, we're going to see nuclear used in for applications that we don't use today, whether it's high temperature industrial applications, remote areas of Alaska or Canada that today depend on very expensive diesel generation, as an example. Um, I see a world where we're going to use advanced reactors to, to take use fuel, what many believe um, see as a waste, and turn it into a very valuable asset um, where we can use these, these fast reactors to recycle and, and burn plutonium. And then, I, and then I believe that uh, SMRs are, um, you know, they're going to become cost, cost competitive. And, you know, I really think that nuclear is going to be a significant source of generation long term in the U.S. It just has, it just has to. If we, if we believe in, in deep decarbonization, I just can't imagine a world where nuclear doesn't play a huge role. And so it's just, it's going to be exciting to be part of that. John Ball, thank you for the work you've been doing. Thank you. Appreciate it.